Welcome to the only place where real, raw, and vulnerable conversations happen with IFBB Bikini Pros to give you an inside look at their struggles, strategies, mindset, passions, and all of life beyond the stage. This podcast is made to inspire, motivate, and remind competitors and the average gym goer that even the most extreme lifestyles and elite athletes have their ups and downs. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm your host, Celeste Rains turk and now it's time for the Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast. Today's video and audio guest was a professional dancer who moved to LA 13 years ago after college to pursue her dreams. She found competing through a friend after a traumatic event in 2015 when she went on a mission to move through a deep depression and find what she wanted to do next in life to really lift her spirits. Eight years in, 17 amateur shows before she earned her pro status in July of 2022 at her fourth attempt at USA's. And then she went on to compete in two pro shows. That is her competition history thus far. And of course, she's heading into another pro season. And this athlete was recently diagnosed with ADHD and OCD and found out she is on the autism spectrum, which is something she shares about extensively with other women since it's commonly undiagnosed in women and often can lead to anxiety and depression like she experienced herself. Recently married as well, this woman of faith is not just breaking the stigma, but also working within the clothing brand that, brand that she co-founded, Pax Fit, to build stronger connections between mental and physical health, which you guys know we love that here. So welcome to the show, Erin May. Uh, I practice this, Erin Maya Hofa, Hofa. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. See, I read that. And then after I read it again, it wasn't the same sound in my head when I wrote it. It's fine. It's, I mean, I'm still working on it myself. (laughs) It's Maya Hofa. Yes. There we go. So yes, we just had a nice little catch up session. For those of you guys who don't know, we were teammates way back in the day. So this feels like a long time coming. I've been a personal fan of Aaron since the beginning, really, since I knew who she was. And I always aspired to own the stage like I see you do. Honestly, I just was captivated by the way that you were on stage, the way that you are on stage. And you've really come a long way. And I'm excited to go over that entire journey. But before we get into that, I always like to ask if there's something you do or think about or a ritual you have before your heel hits the stage. Um, oh gosh, that's a great question. I would say one, it's like not super serious as I always have some gummy bears. <laughs> it's like my go-to <laughs> before I hit the stage. Um, but I really just try my best to disconnect from my phone. Um, I, you know, I don't really take many pictures or videos backstage and sometimes I regret that, but I just kind of need to be in my own zone and just, just focus on myself and um, just stay calm because when I get way too anxious and overwhelmed, it like, I, I could probably fall on my face. So I just need to Zen out. And that just is me being quiet to myself. Yeah, I totally understand that. And sometimes it can be a major distraction when you are on your phone or you're just trying to capture everything in that moment, you kind of miss what you need. Yeah. And that's the last thing we want to do. Um, do you do anything in particular to help you feel more like grounded in that other than stepping away from your phone? Um, sometimes I will just put some music on. I know that's like not a really (laughs) exciting answer. Um, but not anything that is like Beyonce or anything like that. Sometimes it's just like either worship music or something more chill. Um, I do this thing where I dance in my head when I listen to music. And so I kind of do the same thing with being on stage. Like I just like visualize myself doing my routine instead of actually doing it over and over physically. You see a lot of people practicing backstage. If I do that, I almost over practice. So I just like to visualize like, what do I want to look like? What, you know, like when I smirk or whatever it is. So, um, that's something else I do. I love that. Well, in your dance background, I'm sure like for you, 
and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm sure for you, the stage isn't as scary as maybe it is for others. Yeah. I mean, I've been on the stage since I was three. And like the first time I was on stage, my parents were like, oh no, what's going to happen? Because I was a super shy kid. And they're like, maybe she's going to cry. Maybe she's going to like pee herself. And I got out there and I was just like, yeah. And so Aww. they were like, okay. And like, <laughs> <that's stage." laughs> so I love that's it. So cool. Why do you think that is that you were shy, but on stage you're different? Well, I mean, I think a lot of it came with like, you know, I'm 35 now when I was 33 is when I was diagnosed um, with ADHD, OCD and being on the spectrum. And I think just, you know, I was shy because I always, I always knew I was different. I always felt different. So I tended to like mask and try to blend in with other people. So I just was very quiet and kept to myself. I didn't want to draw any attention. Um, so yeah, I think that honestly is why. And then being on stage, I feel like I get to, to be like who even, even myself or like whoever I want to be, whatever personality. So that's why I love dance because each, you know, different style you did or um, different song, you got to be a different personality. And so I got to, to really let that shine. Um, but now with bodybuilding, I like that. I just am myself, but I just like make it bigger. I love that. It's so true. Like it feels this um, like big emotional expression on stage of not just your hard work, but also who you are and a side, at least for me, sometimes it's like I get to express a side that in normal day to day life, like, I mean, you'll, you will catch, you know, me every once in a while when I'm feeling myself walking around with, oh, yeah. like, you know, I'll be doing that, but <laughs> Like you said, it's a little elevated on stage. And, you know, you did bring up too, you think part of you being able to express yourself so much is that it was, you know, you're not masking necessarily. You're able to just Mm -hmm. be. So I want to talk about that journey for you, actually. What even inspired you to get screened and potentially seek out diagnoses? Yeah, uh, I would say COVID. (laughs) It's like the main thing. Um, Right before COVID, January of 2020, um, I was working in tech. And so I no longer needed Instagram to get clients and make money. And so my best friend challenged me and was like, I bet you can't be off Instagram for a month. And I was like, oh, I bet I can. And so I signed out. After a month, I was like, it's kind of nice. I'm going to maybe just do February. It's a short month. And then March, COVID hit. And I was like, hell no, I am not going back in there. Like, I don't, I, this makes me anxious. And so honestly, that time away from Instagram made me sit with a lot of stuff because I wasn't distracted and like mindlessly scrolling and uh, absorbing other people's emotions and whatnot. I had to sit with my own shit. And like, yes, I, I had TikTok, but I didn't like it. I never went on there. I had Facebook, but anytime I went on TikTok, I was getting these videos recommended to me about autism. And I was like, I don't know why I'm getting this, but this girl explained her experience and like getting diagnosed later and why that is common for women to be diagnosed later in life. And I was like, uh, that sounds like me. (laughs) So I started to research and all of that. And then, um, actually it was, it was kind of hard to take that first step to talk to someone because Anytime I would share with like a family member or a close friend, they're like, no, you're not like, I know what someone with autism is like, you're not even close. Like, because, you know, I held a good job and like, I, you know, live my life and I could do all these things, but they're like, no. And so then I would be like, oh, okay. And then I would just like back away from that idea. And finally, I just kind of had it. And so I, um, met with a psychiatrist and she was like, oh my God, this is like, she's like, I know exactly what's going on. Like, (laughs) this is what's going on. So we had like deeper conversations around that. Um, and with that, it really made me feel better about how I lived my life because I always knew that I lived my life a little different. And, um, just like I said, I, I just felt like I didn't fit in. Um, so it kind of gave me this like thumbs up, like, no, you're good. Like there is a reason and now, you know, and now you can move forward with your life and 
change the environment in the way you need to and and make things work for you versus trying to like make things work that work for other people, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes perfect sense. I literally wanted to hear from your perspective, like what had to change in your habits or your environment or your expectations for yourself that actually supported you in feeling more like yourself or feeling like you were able to live through life in a more normal way for you. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many things that go into it. Um, And there's like a lot of overlapping traits and whatnot, but I have various sensitivities. So sound is one and then like touch or feel. I never understood why like randomly I'd want to just have a complete meltdown. Like I didn't know. One thing it it happens when I feel like I've masked for a long time, I'm like emotionally drained. Um, But there are sounds that are triggering to me. And like, I can't always like help it, um, like, you know, the sound per se. But um, so for example, going to like a techno concert, like that repetitives, like it will make me just completely cry. And I never understood that. So now I give myself like, if it happens, I'm like, it's okay. Or I know things to avoid. Um, and I never knew why I didn't like doing certain things that everyone else liked doing. Um, and then the same thing with the clothes. I had a hard time in high school finding clothes to wear and I couldn't, it just, it didn't feel right. Like the clothes didn't feel right on my skin. I didn't know how to explain it to anyone. I'd have meltdowns in the morning. And my mom was like, I don't get it. Like, I don't know what the problem is. That outfit looks fine, but it was like the feeling of it. So, you know, now I just, I, I tend to overpack when I travel. And I also learned that it's not because I'm a bad packer. It's because I don't know how I'm going to feel each day. Am I going to be okay? And like, a t-shirt and like having the shirt touching my armpits, or am I going to need to be in oversized clothes? I don't know. I have to pack all these options. So yeah, I just, you know, have to plan things a little different than everyone else. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the main thing that I've been focusing on is just setting up my environment in a way that works for me. It's so insightful because I think that can apply to so many people who maybe don't know that they're experiencing this or who have similar experiences and they could still learn from yours. And you brought up to the OCD and the ADHD. Did you find that this was in connection to the autism or did you find that this was separate from it? So these tend to have a lot of like overlapping traits. That's also why it can be really hard to diagnose. Um, but yeah, so they, they tend to go hand in hand and in terms of like the anxiety and depression as well, like, you know, having the ADHD and OCD, if we just focus on that alone, it, it made me feel weird or different. And that would give me the anxiety or the depression. Um, so it's interesting talking about OCD, especially with people, because people be like, oh, I, I probably have OCD too, or everyone is a little OCD. And I'm like, no, they're not. Because people are like, well, I like my kitchen super clean and neat too. And I'm like, it's not about cleanliness. Like people think OCD is about being super clean. It's not like that is a main thing that comes up, but it's about routine or like order. So I, (laughs) they're, they're very silly and people would never notice it, but I have to stack bowls in the cupboard in a certain order. I've tried to stack it in different ways. And like, I walk away and I'm like, I can't, I can't. And I go, there's no rhyme or reason for the bowls being stacked the way I stack them, you know? uh, But like the, the difference is like, some people just might like the order that way. But for me, I like, cannot stand it. It has to be set that way. I just do everything in the same order. And if I don't have control over that, I might lose it. So that's kind of the, the main difference and where people kind of misunderstand OCD. Yeah. I honestly think that media portrayals of mental health diagnoses of any sort are over-dramatized to 
create some sort of emotional or dramatic, you know, reaction within someone. But the unfortunate side of it then is that other people will immediately assume that, oh, yours, need, whatever your experience is should be minimized because it's, it doesn't look like this, what I saw in the movie. But right. it's a lot of mental health conditions are on a spectrum. And mm-hmm. that's why we have certain diagnoses based on statistics to determine what level someone's at and what treatment they could benefit from. So right. to have people telling you like, I've got that too, it's a bit minimizing because you're like, it's a very maybe you're orderly, right? But it's not to the level where you couldn't move on with your day until that bowl is stacked the very particular way it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's something that like just a, you know, normal person wouldn't notice. They'd be like, oh, Aaron's stacking the bowls. But so it's like, like, that's a normal thing. People put their bowls in the cupboard. Um, Another example that like people wouldn't think about is I, my shoes need to be the same amount of tightness. So sometimes I need to retie my shoelaces because like, you know, multiple times. And then I have to do the other one multiple times. It's just like, you know, people are like, oh, Aaron's tying her shoes, but they don't understand like the, like how deep it is. Um, so that's also why people are like, yeah, I'm like that too. And I'm like, mm, nah, <laughs> yeah, not quite. What happens if you don't get the shoes the same level of tightness? Do you feel like, okay. Oh, I do. (laughs) You're like, it will be done. (laughs) Like I have, you know, been doing cardio and, and one shoe feels tighter and I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't need to stop. I'll keep going. And then I just know eventually I'm like, I can't stand it. (laughs) Jump up, treadmill, like retime my shoe till it feels even. Yeah. Yeah. See. I've never brought these types of things up to anyone for like a diagnosis or anything, but I always feel like there's certain things where I can't chew on just one side. Like I have to also chew on the other side and then it, it, or if a nail like isn't, it feels different. And then it has, I have like, there's certain things that I personally am just like, Oh, I just have always had this and been this way. And I've never considered um, a potential, you know, reason for it. But when I've mentioned it to people, like, you know, when you're listening to a certain sound and then it's not an even amount, I need to listen to it again on this ear or in this way. Yeah. And since I was a kid, I count every, every time I'm walking up and down stairs, I count them. Yep. No idea why I just do. But see, I wouldn't claim to struggle with the same things you do because I don't know for sure. I just know that those are, I can relate in the experience, but I think for you, it's probably elevated because there's been times where, yes, the shoe is not, the shoe feels uncomfortable, but I can, I, it'll bother me and I'll think about it, but I can still go. So mm-hmm. painting those differences and, sh- and knowing that your experiences can be similar to someone, but it doesn't mean you're having the same um, explanation for it, I think is yeah. important. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the stairs thing, like I, I count things. And when I was younger with stairs in particular, if I didn't end a flight of stairs on the right foot, there are times I've gone back down and done it again. And I've it, done that too. I never even thought anyone else did that. So. <laughs> well, that's the thing is like, you, no one talks about it. Um, just like little things that I do as a kid. And it's like, it's a lot of the time, like in your mind, you know, like with numbers, for example, and you're like, well, well, no one knows that I do that. So you just don't know that other people are doing it too. Yeah. So interesting. You know, what I think is really great about mental health and the differences we all have in the way that we work and the similarities is oftentimes the things that can really drive us crazy actually benefit us in so many ways. So Mm -hmm. since having an understanding of these things and since um, getting a better grasp on what it means and how to change your life to support that, how have you noticed throughout your life it's actually benefited you? Well, now I feel like, for example, in my job, I I'm just super open. So I don't mind sharing things with like my employer. Um, but like when I started at my new job in May, I was upfront about the fact that I do not like creating presentations. Like I, I don't mind have like giving you the information, but 
to make them look a certain, I'm like, I will spend hours because it comes, it shows up as perfectionism. Hmm. Um, but it's, it is a lot of my OCD. So I just communicate. I'm like, listen, if I'm going to create a presentation, it's going to be boring and just bullet points. Like if you want it to look nice, I'm not, I can't do it. I will spend way too much time on it and not enough time on the work that I need to be doing. So I'm open about how I work my best and like why I do certain things and need certain things. And so now I can have support from my manager or my cross-functional partners. They understand like why I do these things. And so then they can adjust working with me, for example. And then it's, you know, it's a good relationship and everyone's happy versus me just like trying to do it like everyone else and just like deeply suffering inside and then work ends and I have a meltdown and I'm just completely paralyzed. So I think really just openly communicating with people. Um, even my husband like is, is such a gem. He's behind me somewhere. So he's probably listening, but um, only seen like, a shadow of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He probably has his headphones in though. Um, but um, like he, he he gets, he doesn't get it. Cause like he experiences the same thing. He's just very, when we met, he was very open to listening and understanding my needs. And so he gave me that safe space to communicate. Um, so like, even if he's going to run the blender, for example, he gives me a heads up. So then it's like, that sound isn't triggering for me. It's not just showing up out of nowhere. He's like, I'm going to run the blender. And I'm like, okay, I'm prepared. Um, and certain things like that. So um, yeah, it's the communication part and you honestly learn who respects that and who doesn't, because there are some people that just think it's BS that I'm just being needy. I was called a princess a lot as a child and because my needs were different and it just, I just seemed like I just was, you know, trying to be special or whatever and needing different treatment. No, my needs were just different and they didn't look like everyone else's. So yeah, communication's key. Have you ever been told that you can't heal your relationship with food unless you stop competing? Or do you feel like a lost cause because every time you've tried to heal your relationship with food, you're always met with the same challenges, judgment, shame, and guilt? but you're ready to get to that root of your relationship with food and really understand your habits and behaviors and make lasting changes that are going to drive you forward in your competition goals as well as your life. And of course, if you don't want to stop competing in this sport that you love, but you also don't want to continue down the rabbit hole that is setting you back in your life, emotions, and potential for success on stage, I want you to know that you can get through this. And no, you do not have to stop competing in order to do so. You truly deserve to have successful preps, productive improvement seasons, and peace of mind year round. Because when your head is full of thoughts of food, eating, or guilt, you cannot invest that energy into the goals you truly care about which is a big reason why I launched the five-week food relationship program and why it has been my most highly demanded program to help competitors like yourself make peace with food so they can pursue the sport they love for the long run without having to worry about sacrificing their mental health. If you want to learn more about this program and hear from others who have done it, then visit www.celestial.fit slash food freedom. Scroll through that page, get some information, and if you're inspired and you are ready to take action on this, go ahead and apply to work with me, and I will be getting back to you within 24 to 48 hours to go over your application and discuss your concerns specifically to determine if and how I can support you. Again, that is at www.celestial.fit slash food freedom. It's interesting how... And when you said that, I'm like, I'm thinking there's probably people listening to this thinking that, right? There's probably people listening like, I would never express this or I would never want to ask someone to accommodate me. But that's that's a boundary. Like we should Mm -hmm. be able to communicate boundaries. I think we need more boundary setting. And when we are openly communicating something, someone else feels safe to do that back. And if someone can't meet our needs, it's a great filter. And Mm -hmm. we have to know what our needs are 
are so we can best perform or serve others like you did with your job. You considered, you know, if they're hiring me to make great presentations, I'm going to tell them straight up, don't hire me because it's not going to happen. We would do that. We we would consider hopefully doing that in any position we're trying to go mm-hmm. for or in any relationship in life is these are things I'm okay with. These are things I'm not okay with. These are the things I prefer. And and here's what happens when we don't do that. And we all accommodate for others. And it's nice when they do that for us too. So when you brought up your husband, I was thinking, is this something he's always been able to do with you? Or did this take time? Well, when we first met, I didn't know he was interested in me. So I just like treated him like a homie. And so I I didn't feel the need to impress someone. Um, you know, so I was just like, ah, I'm just going to word vomit my issues. <laughs> just like, you know, and he listened. Um, and, you know, if I shared like, oh, I read this article or this book that I really felt seen or aligned with, he would go read it um, just to, to try to understand like, oh, what is she feeling and how is she feeling seen? Um, so like I said, he doesn't experience the same things I do, but he's aware, which I don't think he'd ever like met anyone else with these types of needs before. Um, so it, it was over time. And, and, you know, now that we live together, there's like things throughout the day and people are like, oh, you learn habits of someone else that bothers you and whatnot. It's not like habits that affect me. It's just like, again, like the sounds and things like that. He'll be like, okay, I can't slurp. Like if you slurp, if you burp, you can fart. I don't care about farting, but like anything with your mouth, yawning, sneezing, Like, I can't, like, it's cringy to me. It makes my ears hurt. That's how I explain it. So he learns some of those he's, he learns over time, but the whole idea, he, I mean, he picked that up pretty fast. Yeah. I think that's really great that you guys were able to express that. And he took interest in your interest. He took interest in how can I relate to this woman who I've taken a liking to and what would it mean to be able to support her and um, create a nice relationship and it sounds like you guys have been able to do that but I would regret not asking you looking back on your past before you knew that this was something you could express and you could share like what would you hope would change for people who Maybe, maybe young, like you, young Aaron, what do you wish would have been different or would change so that you could have maybe coped better or managed better? Oh man. Um, I think it's, it's starting to happen now, but there are just not enough resources out there. Um, especially with these diagnoses and w- girls and women, because it, um, it, it manifests differently than boys and men. And so that's why it's commonly overlooked, but, I just really wish that there had been more resources, more people talking about it because like a lot of my past relationships failed, even friendships, because I couldn't communicate or express things because I didn't know yet because I hadn't been exposed to these resources. So I really wish that there had been more of that. And so that's why I try to talk about it because there's still not enough. There's not enough research. Um, So I'm like, whatever, I'll just share my own. I don't care putting myself out there. I really don't. If it can help someone, then so be it. But I just need to talk about it more. Yeah, absolutely. Like the educational series you did on your Instagram, that was super awesome because you're right. Women are not studied enough, period let alone uh, young women and girls when it comes to mental health, that is changing because there's starting to be requirements now for uh, more, you could say, equal or equitable studies and in mm-hmm. research and how that money is spent. But it's definitely not enough. And unfortunately, anecdotal stories and evidence aren't always enough to support or back literature. Like they just It'll just be, you know, anecdotal, take it as it is. That's kind of how they look at it. But the more we talk about it, the more we share experiences, the more you are open and educating. I think it gets, it helps push that needle forward and making a social change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and for the, the women part, I, I read something where it's like, you know, over a hundred years ago, women were, they were just like, oh, women are just emotional. <laughs> like, yeah. That's it's- it. When yes, we are, 
more emotional than men. But like, for me, for example, when I have a breakdown, it's just like, oh, she's so dramatic. She's a woman. Um, But like a lot of that's just happening here. So, you know, with, with boys and men, they can measure certain things because for ADHD, they're actually hyperactive, like physically hyperactive. Whereas women and girls, it's all here, like just in your brain. So people, other people can't see it. And it's just like a vicious cycle because you, you feel like it's just you. So you don't say anything either. You think I'm an oddball or everyone else feels like this. And so you're like, this is just normal. And then when you find out it's not normal, it's like, you have to like communicate that. And yeah, it's just really hard to get people to, to believe you people. I just feel like people think I'm like making, making it up, but yeah. It's unfortunate too, because I think, um, boys and girls are expected to fit into these norms that Mm -hmm. have been created societally. But when you actually consider the difference between men and women, on a functioning level, it's very small, the difference. The difference is not even a, it's not like enough to be like, wow, I can really notice that. It's so small. And that difference is just that women will be more likely to prioritize people over things. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that too, it explains why so many women then don't talk about it or they mask it because they want to fit in a community. They want to create mm-hmm. community. They want to feel acceptance and also make other people feel comfortable. So it makes sense when you consider the one difference there really is. And then for boys, of course, unfortunately, I think they're taught that they can't express themselves certain ways or they have to be a certain way. So mm-hmm. when they're out of the norm, it's like, so they, oh, it's a, such a red flag, but for a girl to act more different, it's like, oh, okay. Like she's just trying to like get along with her friends and peers. But for a guy, it's like, it's like this red flag that they need to medicate immediately, which is also quite unfortunate because they don't always consider that the boy just wants to express or learn in different ways, just yeah. like a girl might. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. And like, even like finding a career that works for you as well. It makes sense that I, I've always, not always dance wasn't this way, but you know, I moved into the fitness side and personal training and coaching. And now I'm a a recruiter and, and I've been in like customer service in some shape or form for so long because I, I feel like, because I always, was different and uncomfortable. I always want to make people feel comfortable and safe. And so I get to do that through some sort of customer service, but that's where there's a strength in it because like people just assume those on the spectrum don't have any empathy or they don't have emotion when it's just, they, they do, it's just shows up differently. So like for me, I just, I, I focus so much on other people and helping them feel comfortable because I know what it's like to feel uncomfortable. Yes. In my counseling degree program, they made us look at a lot of different, this came up in a discussion with um, the, like I have to do a field experience and you're put in a group with other people who are also doing their internship and it's like your cohort. So we were led in a discussion around like, okay, if you were to look at these things that so many people label as negative or scary, or they put a stigma on, what if you were to change the the conversation and say, it's a superpower of some sort? Like, what if we Mm -hmm. looked at it like that? How would we maybe see it or judge it differently? And that brings a lot of perspective, I think, because instead of looking at it as something that needs to be fixed, it becomes Mm -hmm. something that can be supported and enhanced and um, utilized as a gift or a superpower for that person. And so we can empower people to explore what makes them different and actually utilize it to their benefit and their unique expression in the world versus trying to get them to conform to what's considered normal. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why I ultimately stepped out of the dance scene because there is, you know, a certain level of networking. And I just like, I'm like, I don't want to go to a party and like big crowds. Like I just want to audition and get a job because I was good enough for it. Not because I knew someone. And so I really struggled with the networking part, but when I 
have smaller groups or like more one-on-one, that's really where I thrive because I can really focus on the one person. And so you'll see a lot of people on the spectrum who are like people like, oh, they're socially awkward. Like I for sure know I'm socially awkward when there's a big group of people. I just like him like just <laughs> sitting back. Um, but like if you get me in like a, a group of like two to three people and I feel comfortable, like I can be me. Um so yeah, and that it's that's how you can play to your superpower is just understanding that about yourself and being able to apply it in a career. Um because some careers you're going to thrive in and some you're just not like, they're going to be so, like, I don't think I could just do, um, I don't even have an example. I don't know. There's a lot of jobs I'm sure I can't do because it's just, it requires too many people, but in recruiting, I get to help people find a job. So I get that one-on-one connection with others. So that's where it is my superpower. I love that. You've identified the strengths and you've utilized them to your benefit. And you've also separated yourself when something's not serving you. And again, I think that anyone can apply that to their life. Like really exemplify your strengths, exemplify what you're great at and what makes you feel the best and minimize the things that maybe take you out of that zone. And Um, I think it's a a really special thing when you can actually see yourself more so for who you are rather than for who you are not to Mm -hmm. other people. So I commend you for that. Thank you. Of course. Well, I do also want to hear a bit about this pro card journey because (laughs) this was a long time coming and it started because you wanted to empower yourself, right? And get through Mm -hmm. a dark time. So how has how has this journey really affected how you view yourself and life and did it serve the purpose you thought it would when you started it yeah great question i mean it it did start off as just like a short term goal just to get my mind off of what i was dealing with in life and because i loved the stage i like did it once and i was like oh that was great um so that's why i kept doing it um but like the first half of, you know, my journey, it was so on and off because I couldn't afford to compete all the time. It's like one show a year and it would just, I'd have to save, save, save for one show. And then it was just too much. So, um, from there, like when I changed coaches and I started working with Paul Ravella, I mean, his approach was way different just to make sure that, um, you know, I could do a few shows a year and continue to improve and all of that. So I feel like my journey really started with Paul. Um, so that was like end of 2018, we did a, an off season together, but, um, yeah, so I feel like that's when it, when it started, but throughout that entire time, I feel like every show that I did, I had like a different purpose behind it. It ultimately led to empowering myself, but And I'm not saying that they were all good purposes. Sometimes I'd be like, I'm going through a breakup. Let me prep so I can feel like hottie with a body, right? Like you you can't have this anymore. You know, (laughs) like it might not be healthy. Um, But, (laughs) but, you know, that's kind of how it, like I went into shows that way sometimes, but um, really it became in terms of empowerment, like, like, how can I, continue to learn more about, yeah, like the, the food and the training and like the science behind all of it. But how can I learn more about myself and my resilience? Um, and just being like, yeah, I think resilient is, is the best word. You know, it's, it's competing's tough and you're being judged and, and you have to kind of have a thick skin, but I swear every show I learn something different about myself that doesn't necessarily have to do with the actual act of competing. Um, so yeah, I rambled. That's that was a beauty. No, that was such a beautiful ramble. It makes me <laughs> also think then about you really, um, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the only national show you competed in was USA's, right? I did junior nationals last year. Okay, but for USA's. Yeah, so I did USA's 2017, 2018, 2021, and then 2022 when I turned pro. But then I've also done junior nationals. 
Okay, so I missed that in your intro then. And I might have done it wrong. <laughs> no, you didn't even type your show history in your intro. That was me like trying to like get it all right. So no, I didn't. But um, all good. I do recall like there were a few times, I think twice in a row, you played 16th at USA's. And you're talking about how, you know, you focused on lessons about yourself and that resilience. I imagine in working so hard between those shows and coming back to get the same placing, I've been there, it teaches you about yourself. What did you learn from having to really grind for that pro card? I mean, I learned that I am like unbreakable, to be honest. Like when I felt like I, you know, you feel like it's going to break you. Um, but really just changing the perspective. And I'm not saying it's like, oh, just do this. It's way easier said than done, but being able to view these opportunities as, you know, something you get to do. Like I am so blessed. Like I'm living a life that so many people would love to live. And so I get to do this. Um, and I've, I mean, I've just had like such a wild life journey in general, and I've had so many like setbacks. It's not just in competing in the placement. So, um, it just, you know, it, it taught me that I am unbreakable and that, you know, if I really want something, I'm, I can get it. What I used to tell my clients in, in a nice way sometimes is, you know, they'd be like, I just can't get the food part down, you know, but I want to look like X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, then you don't really want it. If like I talk about like, you know, let's say I, I want to have like five thousand dollars in savings, and then I'm like, I can't do it. It's like, well, then you don't really want it. Just stop buying coffees and shoes or whatever. Like you just don't really want it. And so I've learned to accept when it's like, okay, yeah, I don't really want it. The thought of it sounds good, but I'm just not like willing. And so like with the show, I just it was over and over, you know, immediately I'm like, I want to quit. But then I'm like, no, I really want this. And I'm, I'm going to do everything that I can do. And it felt like it made my like pro card win so much more special. I can't help but envy people who like do two shows and then they turn pro. I'm like, damn, <laughs> that sounds nice. <laughs> but sometimes I, I'm like, oh, I'm sad that they, they are almost robbed of like that, that joy that you get after like really suffering and having to like, I don't know, go through so much more, but it made that win a lot more sweet. And that's where I can really have that perspective of like, I get to do this. Yeah. I love that. It's shifting from like a, I want to, but I'm not really going to, or I love that. Yeah, the, of like, oh, recognizes okay. when my hand is up. <laughs> That was awesome. I'm like, wait a minute. That I did, I forgot that Zoom can recognize hand gestures. And I was like, well, God, thumbs up. I, for those who are not watching the episode, we just have <laughs> a little thumb popping up dancing on the screen. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that was so cute. It That's was funny. like I I love that me. idea as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, did I, I keep my hands down? No. No. <laughs> it was cute. It added character. That's funny. Um, <laughs> So with that journey, you got to really see for yourself, like, hey, I deserve this. I worked hard for it. I'm resilient. I showed up even through the storms because I know you face different storms throughout that where you're like, I don't know if I should keep going, but you knew you wanted it bad enough to do that. Even when mm -hmm. there were some times in your journey where you weren't even seeing the progress you would normally see because of the stress. And I know faith is important to you in your journey. So how did you lean on or maybe utilize your faith to continue to show up in this as well? Yeah. And this is something I feel everyone knows, whether no matter what you believe in, it's mother earth, the universe, God, whatever. Um, like to, ah, we all tend to pray in times of need or when we are at our worst. And then when things are good, we just like forget. And so it, it, sometimes I felt like God was like almost making my life hell um, or crap because he was like, pay attention to me. 
and was like really trying to grab my attention. And I just, it was, it took time, but I was like, okay, I need to keep this relationship strong, no matter what is going on. Um, you know, even on a day where I just wake up and there's nothing in particular that like is special happening, nothing bad is happening. It's like, God is good. Still good. Like I woke up another day. And so I just really learned how to maintain that relationship. And from there, this, this might not be very Christian of me, but I also learned that I don't need to go to church. I love going to church. Don't get me wrong. I love the worship. I like community and all that, but maybe it's just who I am as a human, but being able to have that one-on-one time, you know, there's like that, and I'm horrible at remembering verses, but like the right hand should not know what the left hand is doing. You know, it's like when people are like, oh, I donated to this foundation. I'm so good. You know, it's like, keep that stuff to yourself. So, and maybe it's because it's LA, but I felt like church was like a place to be seen, not to, to be with God. So I just felt like I need that one-on-one time with him more and no one needs to know about it. You know, like it's, it's our time. And so I learned that about myself that I didn't need to go to church. Yeah. Feel bad. Sorry. (laughs) If your dad's listening, I didn't, I don't, don't know what to say other than that. It's about relationship (laughs) with God over anything like that. I personally learned that's relationship over religion. And Mm -hmm. I think if you can maintain that through everything, yes, it's important to have a community, but church can be found in your loved ones and church can be found in the people you connect with and talk about God with, yeah. or you have spiritual connection with. And um, it doesn't have to be again, that like grand gesture, um, you know, <laughs> they wanted churches to look like hospitals. They wanted churches to, be a place where anyone could go so we can mm-hmm. create that in our own life it, and like you said it doesn't have to be in um you know a chapel necessarily and your relationship with god comes above anything and it sounds like what i really like about what you said was even in the struggle he's good and even when things are okay he's good or when things are great he's still good like all of all of the time and uh i think in that progression through your life and everything you've been through it must have been at times difficult to see it that way oh yeah there were times where I'm like I don't believe like how am I going through this and you're letting this happen but you know as I come out of those times I realize like it just needed to learn to trust and to lean on him and not even just him like I am very stubborn. I don't like to ask for help. And so I really had to learn how to ask for help and let other people in because, you know, it, it it is an opportunity for people to be able to, you know, I think it's, it's some form of joy to be able to help someone not for your own benefit. Like, Oh, again, like, look how good I am, but like to be able to help someone while they're in a dark place. I think that it's good for both sides. There can be joy for the giver as well. So I really, yeah, I really had to learn how to ask for help and just put my, my ego aside. And it was hard. It was really hard. It was uncomfortable, but now it like the more I practice it, the easier it gets a little bit, but it's helped me be a little less stubborn. Yeah. I love that. It's not, um, it's not always perfect. That's for sure. And no, you, you know, you talked about also you needed to get to a place for competing where you were able to sustain this and keep going and, um, have stability mentally and financially. And we talked about spiritually and you also wanted to make sure it had nothing to do with anyone but yourself. So, mm-hmm for others considering how do you, how you get to a place of peace personally and financially to make this goal happen, what would you tell them or what steps did you take that supported you in being able to do that? I, t- I feel like I took a completely backwards approach, to be honest. Um, you know, cause I was an entrepreneur for almost 10 years from dance to fitness. And it's probably like my, you know, being on the spectrum or having ADHD. I was like, I need a nine to five. 
Like most people are like go corporate to like entrepreneur. I did it the other way. I realized like, you know, if I have no money, it didn't motivate me to work harder. It, it totally destroyed me. And so I, I just really wanted more stability. And so like now having a job in tech and a nine to five Monday through Friday, I feel like I can actually do my job well and I can focus so weird. So that's, that's how I was able to do it financially. But I think what is like really behind that was the benefits that came with my job to get help. Because if you're stepping into, you know, this world, you really need to love your body as is. Whereas a lot of people go into it to, you know, they want to get in shape so they can learn, so they can love their body then. Like having that before the journey is so important because it can actually do like worse. It could do the opposite of what you think you're doing. Um, so I would say that, but then like the financial aspects, I'm probably not the person to ask, but budgeting is huge. Um, and, and really like learning from other people. I started a couple of years ago, just watching more YouTube videos of people vlogging. And I'm like, what do they do to kind of like not cut corners, but maybe help a little bit with shows and whatnot. And so I just started doing that. Um, and just kind of shaving off some things where I could. Um, but I also had to understand that other things would be sacrificed a bit, you know, like probably not going to take some grand vacation a year that I'm prepping and I'm going to have to be okay with that. So prioritize things, make sure, you know, what is most important to you. And then also talk with your friends and family because the support system is extremely important. Love that. And this episode is actually really good timing because I just had someone on and we were talking about how the entrepreneur life is not for everyone, despite what your Instagram (laughs) feed tells you. So I love that you shared that experience and also think it's really great too, how you were able to pursue that and, and find what was best for you. You said that it's important to prioritize. I'm wondering what made and what makes bodybuilding something so worth pursuing in your mind? Oh my gosh. I think, I think it's fascinating to see what the human body is capable of. I mean, you can do, you could do that outside of bodybuilding and whatnot, but it's just like a whole different level. Um, it may, maybe it's because I grew up as a dancer, but I like being really regimented and like having that routine. Um, and so I, I felt like the rest of my life improves when I'm prepping. Maybe I feel like I have a purpose to some extent, but also if, you know, I have to be, everything has to be in order in like my training and my food. And so then the rest of my life has to be in order <laughs> yep. um, to make those happen. Right. Like if I was just going to sleep in or like stay up late and just skip my meal prep, right. Like it's, it's not going to work, but I just think being able to see what you're capable of is it's just so worth it. I mean, at least once try it. And if you're like, that wasn't for me, that's fine. But you get to see what you're capable of. Love that. So true. And I know I'm looking at the time. I'm like, dang, this hour has flown by. But if you have time for maybe like eight to 10 more minutes, I just have another topic I really want to ask you about before I get your advice and everything. Okay. Awesome, man. I feel like we could talk all day too, which is why my soul is like, "Ah, um, time doesn't, time shouldn't even exist. Um, (laughs) anyway, I wanted to talk about before your pro debut. So you got a breast augmentation and shared in a post that it was really hard on you because of that time off training and feeling like you were starting over when you went back Mm -hmm. into it. How did that time off influence how you saw rest as well as having other outlets potentially if this was an impact for mental health outside of the Mm -hmm. gym? You know, I actually had a really interesting situation, very long story short, and I don't know like legally if I can get into it yet, but I... I was in like a really bad job situation. I was laid off a year ago in my tech job. Then I joined another company that a friend owned and I was conned. So I was owed a lot of money 
So, and that's where I had to learn to like lean on my husband, for example, because I couldn't, I wasn't making any money. He had to pay rent, bills, everything for five months for me. So that was really hard. Um, and that happened right when I got my breast augmentation. So I didn't have the gym as an outlet. <laughs> so the timing of it was kind of crap, but I saw the time off as a blessing because I had not taken a time off like that in my entire life. I was always dancing or I was always in the gym. And so that just gave me again, like more of one-on-one time with God. But then also I started being creative in other ways. Like I was doing like coloring books, like my husband thinks it's so goofy, but like, it was a way that like, I couldn't be on my phone because I was coloring. (laughs) And so it, you know, like now I have that, I'm like, Oh, I like doing that. So when I feel like I need to like wind down, I'm like, I like coloring or puzzles. Um, so that was kind of my outlet, but then, and I was ignoring people who would say this or like, Oh, you're going to bounce back so fast. Once you start training, I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. Like there's new stuff in my body. Like, how am I going to bounce back? But it was within like two weeks that my strength was back for the most part in my upper body, you know, some things were still weird, but, um, and I feel like I came back better. And that's even what Paul said to me. He was like, any girl that I've worked with who have, who's gotten a breast augmentation and had to take time off always came back better. Mm. And like, yes, I did lose some muscle, but I got all that rest and I got that sleep. I wasn't like, you know, straining myself in any way. So I feel like that was so important for me to experience because now I got to take my body to a whole different level that I don't know that I could have done had I not taken that time off. Cause I'm also just like way hard on myself and probably too hardcore. And I'm just always like, go, go, go. And I would not have, I would not have done that without the breast augmentation. No way. It's interesting how when we need that break the most, like something comes up or something happens that forces us sometimes to take it. And then we learn yeah. the lesson of how beautiful and powerful it is to our success. And we learn to take more of it sometimes and know that the world's not going to end because a lot of us do have that fixated, focused mentality after the goals, but we need that step back and I also really like how when you announced you were getting your breast augmentation, you were like 34 years into my life. And I finally decided to do something that makes me happy. So can you expand more on that message of doing things for yourself and and why that was pivotal? Yeah. I mean, I, it it was probably because, you know, growing up, that was such a stigma and I feel like it's a little more accepted now. Sadly, like that's, that was just my journey. I really wish I would have done it way sooner, but Hey, it happened how it happened. Um, but like, I, I was so scared to do it because, you know, I even get crap from people about getting tattoos, like tattoos make me so happy. I just love them. So I'm like, well, what are people going to say about boobs? (laughs) You know, like people going to judge me. And I, I just have always had the fear of being judged. And so, I don't know. I just like hit this point where I'm like, I'm not getting any younger. (laughs) So, you know, I've spent most of my life pouring into others and I haven't really poured into myself. And that's when I was just like, and and I did make that decision around like a time when like kind of dating someone. And I just was like, I'm, I'm so sick of like caring about people who don't care as much about me. So I don't know. I think in my brain, it just kind of switched. And I was like, screw it. I'm just, I'm going to do it. Like, I'm going to put that money into it. Like I will get that money back. I I mean, and then I got conned funny enough. Um, but yeah, so I, I just, and now it's helping me a little more make those decisions. Like it, 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 on a mental health front too, typically, like you mentioned, our bodies almost force us, like you get sick because maybe you're doing too much and your body's like, you need to slow down. So I'm going to make you sick. So you'll rest. Now I'm very self-aware of like, when I like feel burnout coming, for example, um, like I'm feeling that right now. And like having that awareness, I then make different decisions. So even in my job, like I communicate, like, this is how I'm feeling. And so I try to like, stay ahead of it before I have a complete 
nervous breakdown and like have to take like a couple weeks off because of my mental health being shit. Um, you know, so it just, it, it was that awareness, um, to take care of myself before other things kind of like take care of me. <laughs> totally. You have to know your threshold and you mm-hmm. learn that when you push it. And then when you pull back and you find where it's best fitting for you. So, um, before I get your best advice, although you've given us a lot, I would love to hear, uh, what your plans are for competing and how you're preparing for your next season. Yeah. Well, I'm actually winding down a season, um, because of like, you know, I started prepping mid February when I was, a you know, clear to train again. Um, and then all this like financial stuff happened. And so like my body did not respond. It was like, nah, freak it. like the scale is just a number. I get it. But like, it stayed at the same weight for months. And like, I saw physical changes, but my body just did not. Cause I have so stressed. Um, so like mentally I've been, I've just been doing this for like almost the entire year at this point. And I'm kind of tired and I started a new job and it's a startup. So life is just hectic. Mm. I've done two shows this season. I'm going to do one more in three weeks. I'm going to do Legion sports fest. And I'm gonna just... that. That's so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just, yeah, I'm like going to just chill out for like the rest of the year and like kind of maintain. And then pick back up at the beginning of 2024. Cause the ultimate goal is the Olympia qualification. Right. And so, um, but I could keep, keep going and like, try to like do as many shows this year. Or I like, like I said, I I'm recognizing that I'm feeling the burnout. So I'm going to pull it back a little bit and just like recenter myself, get my life together again, let my wallet heal. Um, and then I'll be good to go at the beginning of the year and I can pick it back up. So that's, that's the plan right now. Love that. Yeah. So insightful. And again, speaking from your own personal experience and how you're applying that. And I'm really excited. I mean, seeing your last couple of shows has been really cool. You've progressed so much, even in short periods of time between shows, you've made big changes. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you bring and Now I got to ask you, what is your best advice for someone who's never competed before, but wants to, and then your best advice for someone on their road to pro. For the first one is find a good coach. Like, do not be afraid to slip into competitors DMS and be like, tell me about your coach. Like I've had people be like, how's working with Paul? Like, what is it like? And find someone like, it is like dating. Like you need to align and and understand each other. The very first call I had with Paul, I remember like just going, Oh my God, this is it. When he was like, your prep should fit into your life. Life shouldn't fit into your prep. Mm. And I was like, Oh damn, no one's ever like, I've always like sat, you know, just try, tried it the other way around. I was like, that makes total sense. So now we have this very open line of communication. I tell him when like, you know, I'm like going through some stuff and then he can adjust my plan. And not just be like, oh, too bad, just going to keep going. And he'll be like, all right, let's, let's, let's go with this and like pull back or adjust macros or just take two rest days and like, just chill out. Um, So like, that was a really big thing. Find a coach that you gel with and like, you both are on the same page and they understand you and your needs. So being open to communicate with them. And of course it's going to take time to build rapport, but someone who's going to like, listen to what your life is like and, and your needs to be able to, you know, so you can be successful. Love that. Yeah. And then road to pro is Mm -hmm. the other one, Mm, man, let's see. I mean, for me, I did, I, I think when I turned pro, it was my fourth show of the season. I, do better the more shows I do, but like really take the feedback from judges. And also again, easier said than done. Try not to compare yourself to other people. Everyone's bodies are so different. And like the, you know, you, you're not going to look like her or her. Um, so just understand what, what is good for your body. So listen to your coach, listen to the judges feedback on what is best for you. Um, and, and just continue to learn what's best for you, even with your posing. Um, because if you try to be like someone else, the, 
that's not really going to get you there. So I just understood what worked for me. And that's when everything just flipped. Mm, That's awesome. Now, how can people follow your journey and connect with you? Yeah. I mean, I'm really just active on Instagram at eGales. It looks like I don't know how to spell eagles. Um, so E-G-A-L-E-S. Um, that's how you can find me. That's, I mean, I'm like sometimes wishy-washy with my posting. Cause I, again, need to take care of myself first, but yeah, that's where you'll find updates and whatnot. Amazing. I'll make sure that's in the show notes page. You guys, that's always on celestial.fit slash podcast. If you're listening right away, it'll be at the top of the website. If you're listening in the future, scroll down to the category section and you will find it there. It's all alphabetized. And of course, we appreciate when you guys tag us as you listen or after you listen, let us know what you took away from the episode or that you listened and enjoyed it. And of course, feel free to share this with your friends, family, teammates, because you don't just see the ways to connect with Aaron on the page, but you'll also see all the episode timestamps, a time stamps, a full episode summary, as well as a bulleted list of topics covered. So you know what to expect. And so do the people you share it with. So thank you guys for tuning in. And Aaron, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. And I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day, night, or morning, wherever you are in the world while you're listening to this episode. Just make it awesome. Bye.